Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you this evening because of the privilege we have in Christ to be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Father, we are asking today that whatever stain anyone may have, any stain whatever of any magnitude, as we all take the opportunity to wash in the blood of the Lamb, you will cleanse everyone in the name of Jesus. Amen. You have told us it's only when you see that blood, the cleansing blood, the soul-saving blood, it's only then you can pass over all the past in the history of anyone. Father, we're asking that tonight that you'll open our eyes so that we'll make use of the privilege of giving us to wash in the blood of Jesus Christ. Teach us as we get into the scriptures. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The study of the book of Acts is not only interesting, but it's challenging as well as instructive. I've told you before that this is the only authentic history of the church that any church and any Christian body has today to be able to study and to be able to take the cue from. That is, if you really want to learn how to do the work of God, you want to see how to apply the principles that Jesus Christ has laid down in establishing the church and carrying on the work of God, here is where you find those principles not only highlighted, not only stated, but carried out in practice. And um, I told you before that the church had been established, the preaching of the gospel was going on, and anywhere the preaching of the gospel has been going on, in power, in purity, as it ought to be, you find that the devil is stirred up, souls are saved, persecution may arise, and then you'll find that the real faith of the believers is actually tested. And in the Acts of the Apostles, we've seen the Holy Ghost coming upon the church, we have seen the power of God manifested, we've seen miracles that have taken place, we've seen the dynamic preaching of the apostles and other preachers in the New Testament. We've seen the devil stirred up and we've seen religious people also stirred up and we've seen how these people, the preachers, apostles and laymen, were used of God and when they were called to question before the council, we have seen how by the Spirit of God, in God's wisdom, they have answered. We're focusing on the life of Stephen. And I told you last week that Stephen had been challenged and called into question. The charge against him was that he had spoken blasphemy. He had spoken blasphemy, they said, on four counts. Number one, he had spoken blasphemy against God. Number two, he had spoken blasphemy against Moses. Number three, he had spoken blasphemy against the law. And number, three, had number four, he had spoken blasphemy against the temple. Four sensitive, delicate areas. Very sensitive in the heart of every Israelite and in the hearts of the religious leaders of Israel. God, Moses, the law and the temple. And as he was called because of that challenge and because of the false witnesses against him, he was now given opportunity to answer for himself. Just to refresh your memory, let's look at Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. Verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word, and the saying pleased the whole multitude. And he chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte, a convert from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed and laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith, 
And now we have been introduced to seven men. These men were elders in the church. In the early church, there were preaching elders and there were business elders. The preaching elders were primarily to preach the word. They were not apostles, they were not prophets, they were not evangelists, they were not pastors, they were not teachers. But they were preachers of the word. If you like, they were exhorters. Because we're told that in the ministry of, in the church, in the ministerial gifts, there were those who exhorted. And Paul the apostle was saying that he that exhorted should wait on exhortation. He that teaches should wait on teaching. These were uh, elders, but they were not just preaching elders. They were business elders. They were involved in the day-to-day -day distribution of food and material things to the body of Christ, to the saints at Jerusalem, because in the administration, distribution of food, the widows, the Grecian widows, had been neglected. Because of that, there was a complaint. It was that complaint that made all these seven men to be chosen. And I've just read to you from verse 5, the names of those seven men. And they all spoke Greek. They were Grecians. Then I've also told you before the qualifications of these seven men. Because you understand, if men are going to carry on the work of the Lord, there are qualifications. It's not only zeal. It's not only fire. It's not only heat. It's not only the ability and the willingness and the desire to stand up and minister in the church. There are qualifications because if you are going to exalt Christ and preach Christ and project Christ and proclaim Christ, you must understand that that Christ is Savior and you must have known that. If you are going to be able to sell the fruit, you must have partaken of the fruit. If you are going to give the bread of life, you must have taken part of the bread of life. If you are going to present the water of life to other people, you must have been taking part of that water of life. These were saved. They were not just men from outside. They were men from among you. From among you means they were part of the church. Can I remind you of the Greek word for the church? It's ecclesia. And it means those who are called out, called out of sin, called out of evil, called out of corruption, called out of the system of the world. These were people from among you. They were part of the ecclesia. Those who are already called. And they have answered that call out of evil. Now, these seven men were saved. Not only that, they were men that were supposed to be of honest report transparent character. You know, the church today, and it's a pity, that um, you read about the church, you learn about the church, and the church you see today, the visible church, is all upside down. There is confusion, there is corruption, there is evil, there is sin, there is idolatry, there is immorality, name it. Any type of sin you can mention today, you find it just within the walls of the church. You even find it on the platform of almost every church. Almost every church. Almost every church. Church leaders and church pastors and church deacons and church elders be uh, belonging to secret calls and having evil in their lives. But you know, these were to be men of honest report. What does that mean? That means you are clean, transparently clean every way. You start from your behavior, your family life, your financial life, your moral life. I mean, they wanted people that were clean. People that didn't have any skeleton in their cupboard. People you could investigate. People you could interrogate. People you could interview. People you could talk to. People you could find out anything about their lives, private or public, family or secular, social, in any way. And there were people that were clean. Let me throw this challenge to you. Now you're sitting there and I'm sure that you sometimes want to stand up and preach the gospel. You are looking up to the Lord. Maybe one day he'll make you an evangelist or make you a pastor or make you a teacher or make you a prophet or even perhaps an apostle or just a preaching elder or just a business elder or just a deacon in the church of God. Let me ask you, are you one among the church? I told you before. The caterpillars aren't going to ever be able to do anything in the house of God. They should be pillars. People who are always there, dependable, 
when the going is tough, they are there. When there is difficulty, they are there. When a storm is rising, they are there. When there is opposition, there is, they are there. When there is persecution, they are there. When the message in the church is hard, hard, searching, they are there. And when it appears that they are having difficulties, maybe they are under discipline, they are there. Those are the men the Lord can use. You know, there are people that, there are people among you all the time. And Jesus Christ said, ye are the people that have followed me in all the times of my trial. And uh, when the time comes to reign and to rule and to judge the twelve tribes of Israel, you will be there. Now, they should also be people that, not only that they are saved, not only that they are there, they should be people that are honest, transparent character. Uh, you know, let me talk to you, church, anywhere. If you do not have a clean record, if you know all the time, every evening you have to go to the Lord and say, Oh God, help me cover it up, help me cover it up, I'm so sorry. You know, every night you are repenting, listen to me, you'll never amount to anything in the church of God. You may get to heaven at last, you may, but you may not. You know, you may get to heaven because, you know, every time you're saying, Oh God, forgive me, and you know, God will forgive, God will forgive, I've missed it again. I've been dishonest again. I'm so sorry again. Wash me in the soul cleansing, soul saving blood of Jesus. Wash me, wash me. My records are defiled again. God will wash you. God will clean you up. And if the rapture takes place after you are cleansed, you may be able to make it, but you'll never do anything in the church. I mean in the real church. Secular church, all right. Nominal church, all right. The whitewashed church, all right. The society church, all right. The social church, you may be able to do something over there in the secular, social, nominal church, but I mean in the church of the firstborn, in the church of Christ, in the church of God, where the demand is that the men and the women that are used are men of honest report. If you are not honest and clean, you will not be used of God in such a church. Listen to me. You may maneuver yourself with church politics you may maneuver yourself with you know you're just trying to get your way through and get to the highest point of the church and become an apostle a patriarch a preacher but you know right from there the lord will bring you back to the pew and <laughs> that you are not supposed to be on the pulpit and you know the lord can do it in any way that's why he's God. He has the power. He has the wisdom. He has the dynamism. He has the knowledge. He has the resources of heaven to bring anybody down from the pulpit to the pew. I mean, if God knows that the honesty, the transparent character is not there, that's the church. Because, you know, it's the church of God. And Jesus Christ said, upon this rock, I build my church. He's not building a secular church, social church, nominal church. I mean, you can become anything, a social, secular, nominal church. But in the church that God is building, in the church that Christ is building, if you are not holy, if you are not righteous, if you are not transparently clean, transparently clear and holiness, without holiness, no man shall remain on that pulpit and remain in the church of God doing anything in the church. And so they wanted men. Men, number one, among you. Number two, of honest report. Let me ask you, are you like that? I mean, are your hands clean? Look up here. Women have defiled many, many preachers. Many, many preachers. It's not starting from today. You go back to history. Samson, Solomon, David, name them, in the early days of the children of Israel. And also in the church, in the New Testament, you remember the church of Corinth? Women did something to pull down some individuals. And in the church today, it's no less true. It's still there. Let me ask you this question. Are you clean? Are you honest in your dealings with women? If you're a preacher, if you're a zona leader, 
If you're an area leader, house fellowship leader, worker in the church, I mean church of God, are you honest, honest, honest in your dealings with women? Number two, are you honest on financial matters, in money? Or are you carried away by money? You know, the love of money is the root of all evil. And if you love money, you will hate yourself at last and in eternity. But you know, to be of honest report, you have to be clean when it comes to women. You have to be clean when it comes to money. You have to be clean when it comes to relationship, social interaction with people. Now, the members of the church will not be following you about as a preacher, as a zonal leader, as a worker in the church, but you have to make sure that the Holy Ghost can testify on your behalf that you are a clean vessel because you'll be at the vessel of the Lord. Now, listen to me. There are not only men among you that are saved and steadfast, always there and zealous for the Lord. There are not only pe people of honest report, they are also to be full of the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. I was telling you yesterday, Sunday, that there are many people that have left reliance and dependence upon the Holy Ghost and they only depend now upon common sense. When they counsel, it's just common sense. When they preach, it's just common sense. They don't have time to read this Bible, to examine this Bible. They do not have time to be able to go on their knees and wait upon the Lord and have the anointing and the power and the unction of the Holy Ghost upon their lives. But you know, if you are going to amount to anything in the church, if you are going to work for the Lord and do the work of the Lord the way the Lord requires it, you are going to be a man of the Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Not only that you have the Holy Ghost, not only that you have tasted the power of the Holy Ghost, not only that you have interaction, relationship with the Holy Ghost, not only that he has been your comforter, but that you are under the full control of the Holy Ghost. My brother, it's more than speaking in tongues. It's more than emotion. It's more than shaking. And I know that, you know, many, many people carry on the work of God. Oh yes, they speak in tongues, they shake, they're emotional. But I'm talking about being full of the Holy Ghost, under the control and the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Now, there should be men, one among you, two, of honest report, three, full of the Holy Ghost, and four, they should have the wisdom of God. Not carnal wisdom. Not carnal wisdom. Not uh, wisdom you get from experience by reading the newspapers, listening to the news, and, uh, you know, reading, some, reading the back page of the Bible. You know, there is a type of wisdom you get when you don't read the inside of the Bible, but all you read is, you know, the back side of the Bible, the title on the chapters of the Bible. There is, a wis there is a type of wisdom you get when that is all you read. But I'm talking of the wisdom of God, the wisdom that is from above. And you, you cannot do any work successfully in the church without having the wisdom of God. And these men, they had all these qualities. And now seven of them were chosen. And uh, as these seven were chosen, we come across the first, the greatest of them all. His name is Stephen. And you know, it doesn't matter what name you are called by, apostle or prophet, or evangelist, or pastor, or teacher, or deacon, or reverend, or bishop, it doesn't really matter. You know, Stephen was just a business elder. He was just to be in charge of the distribution of food. But you know what? He was a man that had the Holy Ghost, the fruit of the Holy Ghost, and the gifts of the Holy Ghost. And you find in verse 8, about this Stephen, chapter 6 of verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. And in verse 10, and they were, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. And now, because of his life, and because of his gifts, and because of his ministry, I told you about that before, the miracles that attended his ministry, 
the power behind his ministry, the anointing upon him whenever he opened his mouth, the power that came out, the light, the knowledge, everything that came out whenever he talked. They just could not know how to manage him. They couldn't know how to handle him. And eventually, you know, he had been, he had been reaching some people in Jerusalem. But now, listen to me. Because you may not understand the ministry of Stephen, the difference between it and the ministry of the apostles. You see, the apostles too had been busy. They were talking to, Grecian, uh, to, uh, to um, Hebrew people. They were talking to the people of their own land. The people who were resident in Jerusalem. But do you know, there had been many Hebrews who were scattered all about. And over there where they were scattered to, they had learned the Greek language. And they were under the Greek culture. Many of these people came back home. Listen to me. It's like many, many years ago when there were many Nigerians in Ghana, in Ivory Coast, in Upper Volta, in, uh, in Cameroon, many countries around because of trade and because of business. But uh, there was a time when an edict was given in some of these countries and they were sent back home. You picture a Nigeria here having some Nigerians, but those Nigerians not born here, born in Ghana, born in Ivory Coast, born in um, Burkina Faso, born in, um, in Cameroon, born in Niger Republic, born in Mali, born all over, and now they are back home. These people were of uh, the dispersion, and they, had, they understood the Greek language and the Greek culture. These were the people that uh, Stephen went to. They were in their various synagogues. Look at verse 9. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, and Cyrenians, and Alexandrian, and of them of Shalisha, and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. While the apostles were busy reaching the Hebrews that were always in Jerusalem, Stephen had this challenge in going to confront the, uh, the Hebrews that were of Grecian background, that came from many, many parts of the world, and they were now back in Jerusalem. And uh, he was talking to them, and they couldn't resist the power of his word, the authority of his word. They couldn't resist the wisdom with which he spoke. And then, when they didn't know how to just handle him, they called together witnesses, false witnesses, and in verse 11, and the suborned men, the hired men, which say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Look up here. Anytime, anything, whatever, a stain came from anybody on the name of God. On the name of Moses, the normal average Jew, zealous of the law, zealous of the commandments that they got from the hand of God through Moses, the normal average Jew can kill at the blink of the eyes. Because it was a sensitive thing to them. They, in a secular way, in a nominal way, they respected God, they loved God, I mean just nominally but in a fanatical way. And if you did anything they felt was a blasphemy against God and against Moses, those two counts alone were enough to just make them more, to lynch you and just to tear you into pieces. And these uh, hired witnesses, they came and they said, oh yes, we heard him. You know how many people they took in Israel before they will just stone a person, only two people. Out of the mouth of only two witnesses, they will just stone that individual. And you see, the witnesses said, we, not only I, not only one person. And um, they had these witnesses against him. We heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. In um, verse 13, and the set of false witnesses, which said, this man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and uh, the law that finalizes it. False witnesses, not just one, not just even two, and the high priest and the members of the council, they thought they had got enough, enough evidence. This man, Stephen, 
proclaiming about Jesus Christ. He has now blasph he has said blasphemous words against God. That alone was enough to have him stoned. Against Moses, that was enough to have him stoned and not give him any burial, just to leave him for the dogs to, to eat him up. And against the law, that was enough to burn him at the stake. And against the temple, it was enough to torture him with untold torture and just make him to die a cruel, shameful death. And, but before they will do that, they still had a resemblance of what we will call justice. Well, they had decided what they would do. They knew that they would have to eventually kill this man because he had been guilty of four counts, a charge against him. He had spoken blasphemous words against God, against Moses, against the law, and against the temple. But before they will do that, they will give him what they will call his own a trial. Fake, not genuine, not having a heart to want to know the truth, but they were going to just uh, allow justice to have a fair play. Now they called him, and they wanted him to be able to defend himself. And please, when you read the Bible, you must have an appreciation for those people. I mean, those leaders, those preachers in the early church. And this is just fascinating interesting, challenging, captivating. Because Stephen was not prepared for this. Stephen was not ordained a preacher. He was not ordained an apostle. He was not ordained uh, to defend the faith. In theology, there is something we call apologetics, from the Greek apology. And they say that is from the word you get, our English word apology. And it means to be able to tender uh, some statements, to be able to clear up the truth on a particular issue. And the greatest apologetics uh, in, the, in the New Testament church came from that man, Paul the Apostle. He defended the faith anywhere. With the Athens, many people that have gone to universities, with the philosophers, with the Epicureans, with the people of idol, of idol worship, anywhere to Thessalonica or Corinth or Athens or Antioch, the major ports of the world, anywhere people were congregated, people that were high up. Paul the Apostle defended the faith. He earnestly contended for the faith once delivered unto the saints. He was the first man, the greatest man in apologetics, in defending the faith. But now, Stephen. Stephen defended the faith. He defended the word of God. He defended the plan of God, the plan of redemption. And as he came on, listen to me, there was no outline in his hand. It wasn't a prepared sermon. He wasn't ready, when you think of preparation in our secular, theological way, he wasn't ready for that. But now they called him, and he said in uh, Acts chapter 7, verse 1, Then said the high priest, Are these things so? Look up here. You remember the charges? Just four. Blasphemy, one, against God. Two, against Moses. Three, against um, the law. Four, against the temple. And Stephen unprepared Stephen unnotified before this time he took up the charges one by one and he started from the greatest he started to defend his view his stand to defend himself on what he have said he spoke against God and he picked up about God and do you know in this um, defense he mentioned the name of God 19 times. And after that, he, he started with Moses. And he mentioned Moses nine times. After that, he went to the law. And after that, he went to the temple. And after all that, he, he rounded up. He was going to give his conclusion. And was going to tell them and convict them of sin. And present Christ to them and tell them their Messiah had come. But they had rejected the Messiah. I mean, it was a masterpiece. And I told you last week, if you are really called of God to preach, number one, you'll be coherent, you'll be logical, you'll be consistent. 
when you present the message you are presenting. But you know there are people that give them one month's notice that they are going to preach. Give them um, three months notice that they are going to present a particular message. They don't know where to start, where to end. They give a message without an introduction, a message without a body, a message without a conclusion, a message without uh, any point. You can't really grasp anything from what they are saying. And there is, no, uh, there is no content in what they are saying. Not Stephen, not Stephen. And he started by telling them. And he said in verse 2, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. What does it mean, hacking? It means, listen to me. You see, is that where you got, uh, listen to me every time you preach? Well, I don't really know. But, uh, brothers, sisters, brethren, hacking, listen to me. Uh, you know, we're just in Bible line. He wanted their attention. And he told them, now, pay attention. That's what he said. Listen to me. That's what he said. Hurking. That's what he said. And then he began to say, the God of glory. You know, they challenged him against his belief in God. And he said, the God of glory. What does that mean? The God who is glorious in power, glorious in holiness, glorious in majesty, glorious in his works, glorious in his miracles. That's the God I believe. The God that called Abraham. The God that is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He gave them the whole shot the God of glory, with all the attributes of God. And he began to talk about God. Then he talked about Isaac and Israel, that is Jacob. And he talked about the 12 patriarchs and how with envy they sold Joseph. And at the second appearance, the second time, um, they received or they knew or they identified a Joseph. And now he's going to talk about Moses because he had cleared up beyond any shadow of doubt. He had cleared up the accusation against him concerning um, God. Now about Moses, and this is fantastic. Now listen to me. There are many things we could talk about in the life of Moses. You know, Moses had his times of mistake. He killed somebody. You know, that was a bad thing. And he had to go in exile and run away. That was something negative. And you know that when the Lord called him, he was complaining, saying, I'm a stammerer, I'm a stammerer, I stutter, I cannot talk well. You know, that was negative. And do you know that even when he had come into uh, the land of Egypt to take away the children of Israel, when they now came out and they came to the wilderness, you know there was a time he struck the rock two times, and God was angry against him, and did not even allow him to enter into the land of Canaan. But listen to me. Do you know, in all the things that Stephen said about Moses, he never mentioned any of those things. He never mentioned any of those things. Now, part of the responsibility of the preacher is to know what to include in your message and what to exclude in your message. And Stephen was a master preacher. Because, you know, they were challenging him that he was a blasphemer and they wanted to catch him if he will say anything negative about Moses. But, you know... He went on and he talked about Moses and there was no negative utterance that he said about Moses. He talked about his childhood, about the challenge of Moses or the call, and then he talked about the commission and he talked about the conquest. Now let's see from Acts chapter 7, verse 17. But when the time of the promise drew nigh, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose, which knew not Joseph. The same dealt subtly with our kindred, and evil entreated our fathers so that they cast out their young children. To the end, they might not live. In, the, in which time Moses was born and was exceeding fear, nourished up in his father's house three months. And when he was cast out, Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and in deeds. Look up here. Now, they have given him this charge. 
and I've told you over and over so that you'll never forget the charge against Sir Stephen, blasphemy against God, Moses, the law, and the temple. Already now he had cleared up the charge on the side of God. And he wanted to just go into the side of Moses. And do you know how he just goes beautifully? How there was a bridge between point number one and point number two? Can you see the smooth takeover, the smooth, uh, uh, the smooth uh, over, overshooting into the life of Moses? He had been talking about God. He didn't stop for uh, another five minutes and say, well, uh, I'm not going to prepare for the second point. He just smoothly just went on to the second point. And he told about, uh, he had talked about uh, Abraham, about Isaac, about Jacob, about the 12 sons of Jacob, about Joseph, about their coming to Egypt. And then he said, at that time, at that time, when the time of the promise drew near, which promise? The promise that God had given to Abraham, that your descendants will be in the particular place, 430 years. And after that time, I will take them out of the place and they will come and inherit this land where you are. When that time of promise, when it was drawing near, it was at that time the people grew and multiplied in Egypt. And then another king arose, which knew not Joseph. The other pharaoh that knew Joseph had died. Joseph had died. The patriarchs have died. Now there was a king, still the name of Pharaoh, because that Pharaoh is just a title. And uh, this king uh, that rose up now did not know Joseph. And because of that, he dealt in a subtle way, in a dubious way, in a terribly clever manner with the children of Israel. And it was at that time Moses was born. Let me show you that history. In Exodus chapter 1, from verse 6. And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful, and increased abundantly, and multiplied, and waxed exceedingly mighty, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us. And so get them up out of the land. Therefore, they did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens and they built for pharaoh treasure cities python and, and ramses but the more they afflicted them the more they multiplied and grew and they were they were grieved because of the children of israel and the egyptians made the children of israel to serve with regal and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. And all their service wherein they made them serve was with regal. Now, this was the difficulty they had. You see, in verse 15, it says, The king of Egypt spake into, to the Hebrew midwives, of which the name of the one was Sifra, and the name of the other poor. And he said, When ye do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then ye shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then ye shall, she shall live. Now, they had this difficulty at this particular time. And it was a terrible time, but listen to me. In studying the Bible, you must understand, you must understand the Bible is a book of faith, not a book of unbelief, a book of faith. And what we read is to challenge our faith, is to call us back from the path of unbelief. Now, I want to make a point, I want you to really understand. At this time, the king of Egypt, that is Pharaoh, he gave this law, a binding law. And he said, when the midwives were uh, having the office of a uh, midwife for the children of Israel, and they saw anybody that delivered a baby boy, they just killed that boy. Just uh, before that boy is an hour old, just kill the boy off. If it's a girl, preserve the girl. 
But listen to me. If it were today, and there is anything like that, and there were Christians, and they had this difficulty that, you know, whenever their wives were pregnant, and uh, they'll just kill the boys. What do you think the uh, women will do? The women that have no faith, the women that have no future, the women that know not God, even though they're in the church, you know, they'll be looking for doctors for family planning. Because, you know, they'll be saying, after all, what is the point? You become pregnant and you carry it for nine months and at the end of the whole thing, when the child is born, the very first hour of the child on earth, the child is killed. What is the point? That's unbelief. But you know the children of Israel, they were still looking. They knew they were not going to just stay there forever and forever. They knew the promise made unto Abraham, renewed unto Isaac, and also given unto Jacob. And they were serving the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And even though the times were difficult, even though the times were very hard, that they were just killing their babies like that, the women were still becoming pregnant. Isn't that a shame on us? Because now, they're not killing our children. All the trouble you have is how to buy baby food for children. And because of that, so-called Christians will go into all sorts of secret lecture, all sorts of secret maneuvering, going to even people that know not God, telling them about family planning, about how not to have children. Isn't that a shame on you? But you know, even though it was a difficult time, they were having their children. And it was such a time Moses was born. Now, woman, listen to me. Suppose the mother of Moses, uh, when she was pregnant of Moses, was saying, well, there's no use. There is no point. If this, if this child is born and happens to be a boy, the boy will be killed. And I cannot stand any of those um, taskmasters, any of these uh, women coming and just taking my child and just uh, killing the child, the emotional strain and stress on me will be so much. So, doctor, give me an abortion. But you know, Moses' mother didn't do that. Why? Because of her faith. She delivered the child. She knew that it was a boy. After seeing that boy and saw that that boy was fair and she said, no Egyptian is going to kill this one. No Egyptian is going to kill this one. Think about it. A woman that had been pregnant nine months, now had the child. And uh, the child had been born and she was able to hide the child for three months. How? If her best friends were Egyptians... Those brief, best friends of Egyptians would have reported to the other people. They will come into that house and they will say, we hear a child has been born. Let us see. We want to have a census, whether it is a boy or it's a girl. She didn't have her best friends to be Egyptians, Christian woman. And you know, that is, you know when you are a mother of a deliverer, and you are a, a woman of faith, and you are a man of faith as a father, that's how Moses was preserved. Now let's go on. In verse uh, 22, and Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born, ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. Chapter 2, and there went a man of the house of Levi, and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son. And when she saw him, that he, he was a goodly child, she hid him three months. And when she could, not long, she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with peach and uh, put the child therein. And she laid the child in the flax by the river's banks. And his sister stood afar off to wait to know what would be done to him. Isn't that a woman of faith? Uh, our women having such faith, such faith, such faith. The future of the church is in your children. The future of the nation is in your children. And to mold the nation and to build the church, all you need to do is to mold your child and mold and build up your child. The future of the deliverance of Israel 
was in the hands of the children that were born in Israel, or sorry, to the Israelites in Egypt. And to bring about that deliverance, you must walk along with God, woman, and allow God to use your faith so that you'll be able to mold and build the life of the deliverer or deliverers. And so, Moses' mother, a woman of faith, when she could not hide him any longer, maybe because of the crying at night, maybe because uh, the child now, because the child is just so active and so agile and, you know, moving now, that she just thought, there's no way I'm going to continue to be able to hide this child. But now, I'm going to put him in the hands of Almighty God. That God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, anywhere, everywhere, that God that will be watching you at night and watching you during the day, let me put this child in his hand. And he made a special basket. And he dotted it with slime. And he made it so, in so, such a way that water will not come into that basket. And he dressed up the child with prayer, with faith, with love, with confidence in God, with the authority of the believer. And he handed over the child into the hands, the invisible but mighty hand of the almighty God. And he said, oh God, oh God, here is this child. From what you are impressing upon my heart, I know this not just an ordinary child. They will not kill him, but he will, he will deliver our nation from all these Egyptians. We are not going to deliver him to the hands of death, but he is going to deliver Israelites from the hands of death. Here is a child in your hand, O oh God, God of my fathers. That's a woman of faith. And now, when that boy was in that basket, look at verse 5. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river. And her maidens walked along by the riverside. By the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flasks, she sent her. She sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child. And behold, the baby wept. And she had compassion on him. And said, this is one of the Hebrew children. Now, daughter's Pharaoh, what are you going to do? Or Pharaoh's daughter, what are you going to do? Because your daddy said, kill him. No, but you see, after seeing that child, the fairness, the beauty of that child, the compassion just rose off from within her. That's God telling Pharaoh's daughter, take him, school him, train him for me. I need his life, and my hand is on his life. Now you see how God was working in all this, but listen to me, women. It is because this woman was a woman of faith. And you men, to listen to me, because you know, men are guilty sometimes of asking their wives now, uh, you must get rid of this baby, you must get rid of this child, uh, you know, I have no work, I have no accommodation, and uh, you know, the austerity is so hard, and I've lost my job, and I've lost everything, if we have another child now, and add that child to the family, what will he eat, what will he do, how shall we close him, oh ye of little faith, stop that, let the child come, behold the sparrows, they toil not, neither do they spin. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Take no thought what we shall eat, what we shall drink, wherewith us shall we be clothed. Is not the life more than meat? Are you not of more value than the sparrows? But you just seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. But you know, men of unbelief. Women of unbelief, they'll be running about. Well, how can I have the abortion? How can I kill the child? Don't let your hands and your head and your heart and your mind be stained with blood. Beware. So you see, because the woman was a woman of faith, and because the man was a man of faith, they decided they'll keep the child. And you see, God now, at his own time, was keeping the child. In verse 7, Then said a sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Go. 
And the maid went and called the child's mother. Faith pays. If you're a woman of faith, you'll be rewarded. There is no way you can lose if you're a woman of faith. There is no way the austerity can kill you, kill your family, kill your children if you're a woman of faith. There is no way you can go with the flood of the water under the bridge of circumstances if you're a woman of faith. And now in verse um, 9, And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away, nor sit for me, and I will give thee thy... What? Uh -huh. No austerity anymore. The money has come in. Your wages have come in to even take care of your child. The highest baby food that has no poison, that is not fake, from the land of Egypt, you are going to be able to have for this child Moses, because Moses must feed on royal food, must feed from the royal market, and must feed from everything coming from the palace. That is the way of God. Why are we so unbelieving? And um, in verse 10, the child grew. And she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter, and she, he became her son. And she called his name Moses. And she said, Because I drew him out of the water. And in Hebrews chapter 11, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 23 and 24. By faith, Moses. When he was born, was he three months in his, of his parents? Because they saw he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Look up at me here. Now, I've taught you tonight, because... A preacher of the New Testament, a preacher of the Word of God, having a New Testament ministry, must, listen to me, must teach faith. Because the Bible is a book of faith. But if you're sitting down there, you're a man of faith, you're a woman of faith, you'll be taking the Word of God. You will not sift the Word of God. You'll not put the Word of God into a basket and be sifting it and be choosing which one you like and which one you don't like. Because, you know, the tendency in a church, any church, is that you hear the word of God given by God through his servant, given under the anointing of the Spirit of God. And then there is somebody that will come to you and will tell you that, well, uh, that's not what the preacher meant. Keep quiet. How do you know what the preacher meant? You shouldn't uh, encourage anybody to commit abortion. You shouldn't encourage any family to just get rid of a pregnancy. Just because uh, uh, you are saying, well, uh, uh, the preacher didn't mean that. The preacher actually knew that you have many children already, and the preacher, the preacher is a human being too. Shut up. We're preaching faith here. We're not preaching unbelief. And we don't want anybody making the people of God to come into unbelief and telling them, well, uh, get rid of the pregnancy, commit abortion, because already you have, uh, you know, so many children. What are the children going to eat? Let the children be born. Do you know what that child will be tomorrow? A head of stage? A president? A leader in the church? An educationist? Somebody that will be used of God. That you don't have money is not your problem. If the child is conceived, let the child be born. Because you may be depriving the country of a great leader in future. And if you, because of the temporary difficulty, austerity, because of the economy now, you may have an idea as to, you know, uh, what shall we do, what shall we do? Listen to me. When I was born, from the story that my mother told me, my mother said it was a time of depression, it was a time of lack, it was a time no salt, you know, during the time of the Second World War, when, uh, you know, Nigerians and people were being drafted into the army to go and fight in the Second World War. And, and you know, at that time, mother didn't know that, uh, mother didn't even know the gospel. 
Mother didn't even know the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Mother didn't know even the Bible. All that mother knew was all just uh, the way of the uh, Aladura people, wearing white garments and just a uh, burning candle. And all that my daddy knew was just go to the church and, and read the Lord's Prayer. But you know, I was born. Here we are today. Suppose because of that austerity, because of that condition, because of that depression, my mother had gone to see a doctor somewhere and they had cleverly, cleverly committed abortion. We don't know what will be happening today. Remove your hand from that child. Give that child a chance to live. After the child is born, you go to God. Whatever it will take. I've told you the time I was born, my mother said, no salt. You couldn't even find salt anywhere. That's what my mother said. And yet, even then at that time, we passed through all those things. Can I tell you this? When I was very, very young, my mother did not allow me to take part. You know why? She said that I was uh, being given pap, the normal, our, the normal Nigerian way of uh, giving a little child food, and it thing just went the wrong way, and I just fainted off. And I just thought, he's gone again. Let me talk to you. The person that was born before me died before I was ever born. That's why they gave me for long show that it's God, this one has come, take care of this one. And now I was now being fed and I died off again. Think about it. They didn't know God. They didn't know why, how God will, you know, do anything. And eventually, I came back to life again. I went to primary school. It was difficult, difficult, difficult. In 1951, when I was in Standard 1, I would leave school and go and bury my book somewhere because I hated school. And my father just beat me, almost killed me in beating me. And then I reacted. I said I wasn't going to school anymore. Now, my father was forced aggressive with me and said, okay, you are not going to school, go to the farm. And I was going to the farm at the age of 10, 1951. And, uh, but... I came back at home and it was holidays and we're going to, the school was going to resume. You know what my father did? My father called me and started begging me. Because I was stubborn, I was adamant. I said, you beat me like that, you treated me like that because of going to school. All right, school or no, I'm not even going to school anymore. I don't like to read anymore. And my father said, okay, you are not going to read, all right. You know, you go to the farm. And I, and I did it. All the yams in the, in the uh, farm, all the um, cocoa yams in the farm, I caught everything. <laughs> now, uh, you don't know I was like that. But you know, my father just called me and he said, anything I wanted, he'll buy for me, and just begged me and begged me and begged me, and I went back to school. After secondary school, my father called me and said, you know how poor I am? I like to educate you, but you know, I don't have the money. Therefore, you go, to, you go to be teaching, and I was teaching. But he said, well, anything you can do for yourself, you can do. I applied to go to university. I didn't know who would pay the school fees. And uh, when the result came and I passed, I was uh, telling somebody, the principal of our school, even though he didn't uh, believe in God, he loved me. And uh, I said, I passed, and while he was rejoicing, I said, excuse me, sir, how will I go? Will you be able to pay? He said, come back in the evening. I came back in the evening, and that's how I went to university and came back. Look at it today. Look at it today. Don't kill that child. Don't kill that child. Leave the child alone. And that's the point I'm making. And I don't want anybody with unbelief, uh, you know, going to a brother here, going to a sister here. Well, uh, you know, we are so and so. Uh, you can kill this child. You can commit abortion. Let's believe God. Even those things may be difficult now. The star is shining. The future is bright. God is on the throne. God gave Israel Moses. And God is giving Nigeria your own child. That child, you may not have money. You may not have food. You may not have anything to be able to take care of the child. You watch it. Leave the child in the hands of God. And tomorrow, 
in our papers, in our churches, in our universities, you'll be seeing those children. And God will tell you, I'm the one taking care and I will carry that child. Rise up and let us pray. You talk to the Lord. The Bible is a book of faith. Let's have faith. Faith in God. Faith in his power. Faith in his protection. Faith in his plan. Faith in his program. Let's have faith in God. Don't kill the child. Be patient with that child after the child is born. Whatever the child may be today, believe in God. Believe in God. Be a man of faith, a woman of faith. Be a believer. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Food or no food, God is on the throne. 